The mountain Mandala rises 15,400 feet above the dense tropical jungle of New Guinea. Last year, Bruce Parry and Mark Anstis set off to attempt its unclimbed south face. To get there, they would have to travel through some of the world's most unexplored terrain, a lost world still inhabited by cannibals. Oh my God, quite a scary boat. I think it's moon. I know that deep down that this expedition is a big one. What we're going to be doing and where we're going and the fact that we're so far from anywhere is going to put some stresses on, on the both of us. So they get into your eye, blind you within a couple of days. We're quite different in character. There's bound to be a little competitive edge which will start up. They took with them two video cameras. This is their extraordinary story. Mark Anstis is a former tank commander. He left the army six years ago, and ever since has devoted his life to going on expeditions to far-flung places. But funding such a lifestyle isn't easy. It's between expeditions, uh, I dangle from buildings and fix things. Friends, and those I was in the army with, uh, are working in the city. They've got good, high-paying jobs, pretty good income, owning a house and things. And this is the price I pay for going on expeditions, which uh, it's well known that that doesn't pay very well. Bruce Parry is also an ex-officer. I've been outside of the, the Royal Marines now 12 years, and all of that time, pretty much, I've been doing expeditions. And the thing I love about my life is getting away and, and my travelling and, and the excitement that that brings. Nice and so. That the byproduct is that I, that I have to rough it, and I don't like roughing it much. But it doesn't matter because that's my lifestyle. I've chosen it, and I, I wouldn't swap it for anything else. I've got friends who've got big mansions in Chelsea, and I could hack crash there. Other times, I've, I'm, you know, I've used up all my credits with my mates, and I often end up in, in mates' offices of places I've worked before, offices, floors, anything. I've led now. 15 quite large expeditions to various parts of the world and and I've always got one up my sleeve and that, that, That's the hardest thing is thinking of the next place to go and the next really exciting journey But there's always one bubbling away in, in, inside my head The next expedition up Bruce's sleeve was to Irian Jaya the Indonesian part of the island of New Guinea He asked Mark to join him and their objective was to climb Mandala a remote and mysterious peak lying near the equator it was climbed in the 50s by a Dutch team who reported that it was so high that it had a permanent snow cap. Together, they set about finding out as much as they could. The mountain has never appeared in any literature, or hardly ever has. And we found one reference in the book written in the 50s, this old dusty hardback found in the, in the back recesses of the Royal Geographical Society. And we found a, a, a quote from one of the guys who'd, who'd first climbed this mountain. He looked over the south edge, having climbed up the north side, into a stupendous abyss. And as we read that, we both thought, right, we're going up that. But to get to the unclimbed south face, they would have to travel from the coast up rivers by canoe and then on foot through some of the most inhospitable and unknown terrain on Earth. But this, look at it, it's just a blank. If there's going to be anyone anywhere, it's going to be there. Yeah. That's the place. It's almost it. undoubtedly still uncontrolled. We knew Irian Jai was full of these amazing, colourful and flamboyant tribes with this notoriety of headhunting and cannibalism right up until the 50s and 60s. But the more we looked at our route, the more we realised that you know, we could find something that perhaps no one's ever seen before. We could find a tribe even in this day and age. Bruce and Mark's plan was to travel light, carrying their own equipment and supplies. In six frantic weeks before Christmas, they assembled their kit, and all that remained was to say goodbye to their friends. It would be six months before they saw them again, if all went well. 
Bye bye, London. Yeah. Nice bar. Cheers. Good mate. Good part of laugh. Enjoy it. The first stage of the expedition was to get as far into the interior as they could, up the Eilanden River. There are virtually no roads in the whole of the country, and people move around by water. They bought a second-hand dugout canoe in need of some maintenance, Irian Jaya style. We're burning this boat so that uh, it will seal in some of, the, uh, some of the areas where water might seep in it and make it quite heavy. We wanted to do it, the whole thing under our own steam. It had to be a canoe, and it had to be a dugout canoe, not some bright orange fiberglass thing. It had to be a proper dugout canoe. We didn't want to be an overbearing sort of presence in each village we came across. And we wanted to be approachable. We didn't want people to be afraid of us. The further we got upstream, the fewer signs there were of westernization and you know going to this territory where we didn't know what was around the next corner we didn't know what was going to happen the, the next day and the further upstream they got the more snippets of information they picked up about some of the tribes they might encounter on their route to the mountain Irian Jaya is made up of an extraordinarily diverse mix of peoples speaking over 250 different languages. These groups are historically fiercely territorial, and many have traditionally eaten the flesh of their enemies as part of their ritual practices. Bruce and Mark were traveling through territory belonging to a tribe called the Azmat, now famous for their carvings, but until very recently, infamous for their cannibalism. They were practicing headhunting and cannibalism right up to the 50s and possibly beyond that. And, uh, and the, the Indonesian government uh, went to quite major lengths to cut back on these practices in the 60s. But further upriver, where Bruce and Mark were heading, modernizing government influence was weaker, and the peoples were rumored to be still living by their traditional ways. Yeah. Mungkin sedikit lagi di atas pak yeah. ada yeah. masih ada orang yeah. panas panas masih ada orang masih yeah. ada masih yeah. sekarang tidak ada tidak. hanya butuh katnau kampung butuh katnau tidak bisa masuk tidak bisa yeah. masih. Masih. masih masih sekarang masih tidak sekarang bisa. tidak bisa masih. anti itu habis bun po. potong ini bakar <laughs> <Masih>. bakar <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> if Bruce and Mark were to encounter any trouble, they couldn't expect help from the Indonesian authorities. In fact, they were avoiding them. Large swathes of the interior are off limits because of simmering civil strife and require special permission to visit. They had no permits. To do an expedition there, especially with a camera, you're opening yourself up for, for all sorts of problems. You're going to have to tell a few fibs in order to get into the areas that, that you want to get into. And, and then once you're there, if you're caught there and you've got these permits but they're not allowing you to, to be where you are, you haven't really got a leg to stand on. The local people, even though they're in, in the middle of nowhere, they, they all have a strong feeling for politics as well, and so they don't always necessarily like visitors either. Ah! 
Their plan was to move as fast as possible upriver, avoiding the authorities and concealing their ultimate intentions. And that wasn't the only threat to keeping the expedition afloat. You see the power of these rivers and they just whisk away trees, like massive trees with all the branches and all the roots just come hurtling down. If you get in the way of that, then you'd just, you'd scuffle totally. It's, uh, it's well known that crocs will often be on the bank and you know, if you get between them and the water, they'll have a go at you and they'll come dashing down and they move very fast and drag you into the water. Now we were already in the water in a canoe, um, which hopefully was going to put them off, but given the stories that we've been told by the locals and in virtually every village we went through, you know, there was no guarantee of that. After nearly two weeks of paddling by day and resting up at night in whichever village they found themselves, they had travelled 150 miles upriver. But a potential obstacle lay ahead that might sink the expedition. Today we're going to reach a village which has got the last police post in the Asmat. And from there on in, we're going to be entering into territories where we're supposed not to really be. This has caused us a few problems because, of course, we can't ask too many questions about these parts where we're not supposed to be going. So it's limited our planning quite substantially. And not only that, but much more seriously, because our friends, Indonesian friends, uh, we don't want to incriminate them. We haven't been able to get them to sponsor us for extended visas. So really, we're here on a tourist visa, which is going to run out in about 28 days time. And our expedition is going to take a lot longer than that. The police presence meant that they couldn't continue further by canoe. The only way forward was through the dense jungle on foot. They would carry their own equipment, but needed to engage local people to act as porters to help carry their food. Their first hiring was Supratman, nicknamed Superman, who acted as their guide and negotiator. <laughs> <laughs> Persuading the locals to enter a neighboring tribe's territory wasn't easy. No one was certain of what reception they might receive ahead. Eventually, five porters decided to risk it. Five, yeah, we're going to need more, mate. They're not happy with the weight. <laughs> Call him, sp we'll put spider on the thing. Laba laba. And then draw one as well, so he knows what. Eight legs, mate. Laba laba. Well, this is it. We're finally off into the Utan, the jungle. We always knew where we were on the map, but it, it made no difference. If you're following a local path, then your map is, is useless because the path doesn't go in a straight line. It'll follow contours, or if you're in flat ground, it'll go to where local knowledge says there's an easy place to cross a river, and it might zigzag around, and you might end up going completely the opposite direction to the one which you want to go in. But the path will eventually get there, you hope. The biggest danger for me about the jungle is the fact that it isn't so instantly uh, nasty and aggressive that you can relax, and if you relax, then it does become dangerous because there's, there are a fair few things out there. But if you're aware of it and you stay switched on, then, then you're okay with it. Their most immediate problem didn't come from the jungle, but from what was on their own backs. They were carrying 90 pounds of weight each. It's lunchtime on our first day of trekking, and uh, We've only been going, what, four hours, and already we're feeling it. It's been a bit of a deep end type reminder of what trekking in the jungle's like. These boys are so agile and so strong, and of course this to them is home, and so they walk and run across these logs carrying their, their, their packs, and it, it means nothing to them. Where of course we, on the other hand, with our slippery boots and, uh, and our very, very less of a sense of balance, uh, are finding it quite tricky. Although we're loving it, I know that uh, it's going to be a bit of a slog getting up that hill. So uh, we've got a long, long journey ahead of us. And if one thing is definitely apparent, it is that certainly I am carrying too much, or too much. I think I need another porter to offload some of this. 
useless junk. <laughs> but it's not useless, we need it all, and that's the problem. <laughs> and that was their dilemma. They had to carry equipment for two completely different environments. The jungle, where temperatures hover at around a sultry 35 degrees centigrade, and the mountain, where it often snows. But what to persevere with and what to ditch was a big decision. Mr. Max, thank you. <laughs> Mark's just given away half his kit to uh, Sue Pratman. And if you're carrying 37 kilos or you know, 80 to 90 pounds, um, it's a real struggle. And all day, you're walking for you know, 12 hours a day. I did think it was, uh, you know, it was asking for a sprained ankle asking for a, 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 an easily avoidable accident in the early stages of the expedition, which might lead to a broken bone. And that's the end of the expedition. And when they weren't on the move, they had to be on guard against some of the jungle's less friendly inhabitants. Hundreds of leeches trying to get at me. Look at these naughty little things. But these little ones are scary, because if they get into your eye, and you can never feel them, they'll blind you within a couple of days. The jungle ensured that progress was slow, sometimes very slow. <laughs> After a week's walking, wet feet weren't a laughing matter anymore. A new insidious problem began to emerge, immersion foot better known as trench foot. Our boots, we, we thought at one stage we were going to need to be able to put crampons on them so we couldn't have jungle boots. So we, had, we knew that whichever boot we had was going to be better in one area and, and worse in another. And I chose to have boots that are better for the mountain. They were too thick and they soaked up the water and they didn't dry. So I got uh, immersion foot quite badly. And basically the skin rots and your skin is white and soft and folded up and it just comes off. So, uh, so basically I had no skin around my toes or along the underside of my foot. We had painkillers to deal with the pain, uh, but the only painkillers we had were actually you know, ones that your body starts to get accustomed to. So they, they weren't a great deal of help in the end. There was little chance of them ever getting their feet dry. The biggest physical obstacle were the rivers. These rivers are, are ex exceptionally dangerous. There is no doubt that if one false move in one of these rivers is, is tantamount to death. There's lots of rules to crossing rivers, but frankly, they all went out the window because we couldn't have physically done it the way that you're supposed to. So we just had to get in there and struggle. Just one river could involve crossing as many as 19 different watercourses. And we tried wading with a safety rope on, but we found that was hopeless because um, the rope would just drag in the water behind the person crossing and become a real hindrance, start pulling them off balance. I think all three of us were swept away at one stage. And for Bruce, a seemingly routine crossing suddenly turned ugly. Give him lots more rope. More rope, more rope. Laggy, laggy, tolly. Laggy, laggy, tolly. Habis! Why? Why? Habis! That doesn't, doesn't look much, that moment there, and like some of the other rivers look bigger, but that, for me, was without doubt probably the scariest. It's so incredibly powerful that it just took me right under. I was so, so tired because it's like being in a fight when you're using every muscle that, that I was just shattered and shaking with adrenaline. They couldn't turn back, even if they wanted to. It was the start of the wet season, and every passing day the rivers were rising, making any retreat extremely hazardous. After two weeks in the jungle, they were on the fringes of the territory where the Korowai lived, the tribe who was still reputed to be practicing cannibalism. To stretch their meagre dried rations, they started to rely on the hunting and foraging skills of their porters. They all have these goggles and a sharp stick powered by an elastic band. And there were some tasty surprises on the menu. Shrimps, 
lots of baked bananas and we've got these delicious sort of uh, berry type fruits for, uh, for pudding. <laughs> Look at that for a shrimp. <laughs> Less than five minutes between the river and my belly. Can't go wrong. That's pretty good. <laughs> wow. Suddenly, they realised they had company. There was someone on the opposite side of the river. We saw the boy on the river, or the two boys, um, in the, playing in the river bank. They were, they were um, trying to get berries from a tree. And it was just it was a very, very exciting moment. Mm -hmm. Although we'd, we'd taken a conscious decision to go into this, this area, we had no idea what our first meeting would be like. In my mind, I always thought we were just going to stroll into a village, but of course it was never going to be like that, and it was slightly naive. So even though we took all this surreptitious footage of this boy bouncing around trying to find these berries, it, was, uh, it, it struck me instantly that we were doing something that was a bit special, and maybe you know, the, the, what we were doing, there was question marks rising in my head, that we were actually there voyeuring this, this little kid doing this thing. The young boy was not alone. Oh my god. Scary bunch. I guess. Mana Tolobo. We had by that time been told so much about these people. Uh, and had so many little snippets of information saying they go there and no one goes there and they eat people and, and yeah, they're still completely asli or original. That we just couldn't fail to, to feel that you know, we were beginning to, to really explore. Wow. Well, these people have just arrived. I don't know if you got us. It's a very awkward little moment, me trying to shake their hands. Um, but they've come and I've asked them to sit down. One of the porters could speak a Korowai dialect. Yeah. 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 I thought it was strange that they didn't have the bows and arrows with them, and so I asked them if they could go back and get it, and they said that the home was a long way away. But sure enough, we persuaded them to go and get them, and they'd just hidden them in the bushes about 20 yards. <laughs> so they're just coming back there. Yeah, they've got uh, three different types of arrows here. Let's move them four. This one's for birds, straight and thin, no barbs on it. And this is uh, is for men. Yeah, this is for men. They came and met us, and it was incredibly amicable, and it was a very friendly, heartwarming, and, and beautiful moment where we were able to communicate with these, with these amazing people. But they were also very s stern, and we weren't able to go across the river and, and see their homestead, which is what we wanted. The initial friendliness of the meeting encouraged Mark and Bruce to aim on going deeper into Korowai country to see if they could find other untouched clans. But their porters weren't happy about going any further. They were very much against it, even though they themselves are from Korowai origins. They did not want us to go and see them, and I think that's for their own self-preservation as much as for ours. They probably thought that if they went in there, that the people would try and shoot them, because they'd see it as like an act of war, maybe. It looks like it would just be the three of us, Mark, myself, and Mr. Supratman, who are going to actually go, be going into the Korowai area itself. Leaving their main supply of provisions in a dump so that they could travel light, Bruce, Mark, and Supratman headed off with enough food for four days. Korowai territory is surrounded by near impenetrable swamps and fast running rivers. Behind these barriers, time has stood still for millennia. Bruce and Mark were truly entering a lost world. A 
of the two of us, I am the less fit or the less strong or whatever. There have been ample moments when uh, I have been visibly, physically shattered. <laughs> Boy, God's name brought me back to the bloody jungle. I have no idea. <sighs> Not enjoying it today? No, well, we're almost there now, <laughs> so uh, one hour more, I think. But we've just gone through a boggy, a boggy stretch in there. It just exhausts me. <laughs> the only time they could stop properly was when they made camp in the evening. It was then they could assess their personal damage. Well, they just started off with scratches, but they're getting constantly wet and they're in just the right place to catch every passing branch and vine. Turning into the tropical ulcers, which is going deep. But they're not too bad. They didn't always see eye to eye on the menu choices. If my eyes are sweating. <laughs> this delicious chicken and pasta has been <laughs> sabotaged. Chilies in it. Whole bloody chili I just ate. Can't even eat the rest of it now. It's too hot. <laughs> Mark hates chili, and uh, Superman and I love it. Crap, man! I'm gonna, I'm gonna drown you. <laughs> they pushed still further into the unknown. We both agreed that yeah, we could easily be being watched, and we'd we'd be none the wiser. We were clumsy, making a lot of noise, falling over, chopping things. They could have been watching us all the way. We wouldn't have had a clue, and they probably were. It was supposed to be just a, a two-day jaunt coming down to where we thought these original tribes people were of the Korowai, but it's about our fifth day now, and, uh, and we're roughing it quite a lot. Mark's uh, feet are in a, a lot of pain at the moment, and so Superman's carrying his bag, and that's put him in a bit of a bad mood, because Mark's rucksack weighs a ton. We were low on food. We were eating a couple of bananas each a day by that stage. Wrap a banana, wrap a pisang, leggy. Leggy. Do you? Uh, yeah, Sembilan. Sembilan. Sembilan, pisang kecil. Pisang kecil. And do it, wrap a hurry. You can do a hurry, Saja. Do a hurry, Saja. Masala? Sidiki. Sidiki. We didn't know whether we whether were going to come and get a, you know, meet these people. We've been walking for a long time. One thing's for sure, this is a man-made path that we're on. And uh, this wasn't done with a machete or any metal object, I think. Uh, and Superman agrees that this is done by uh, a stone axe. We've just spotted the roof of a house. <coughs> and we're gonna see if someone's in. This is the first hut we've found. There's no one here. We've heard voices, but we couldn't get close because the path went off in a different direction. Superman says with, uh, with confidence, oh yes, over here, over there, but, um, but then admits he doesn't have the faintest idea. So, um, so uh, you know, Dimana Korowai. Korowai Kunum Katum. Yeah, Kunum Katum, they're the ones we're looking for. We've just heard, heard some people, or at least what we think was people, cooing and uh, wailing that direction over there. So that's where we're heading. This is a well-hidden path anyway. Oh, 
Selamat pagi, Wamena. Oh. Oh. Ow. Ow. Abu Rashid. Hi, Nikita. Called out the usual greeting before we could really see it properly. We couldn't have expected what happened next. And we could see instantly that they were terrified of us. Oh, 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 tira, mira. Ah, 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 And then Superman suggested that we copy their actions to, to show that we had no aggressive stance. And so we were doing all these things, trying in some way to placate these people. Mr. Bruce, Mr. Bruce. Oh, 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 oh. I think if they hadn't been 25 feet off the ground in their house, they would have run away. But they couldn't run away. Um, they were trapped up there. From within the doorway, one of them retreat, uh, pulling his bow back and, and pointing an arrow at me. Well, he was drawing his bow. Did you see that there was an arrow pointing at me for a second? Lots of question marks. Why don't they want us to visit them? What are they? What are their main reasons? Are they still doing some of the things we heard about when we were in the, on the river? Are they still at war? Do they still hunt heads? All these things we don't know. Somehow I think we're not going to find out just now. But they were being followed. Baba. Oh. Baba. I don't think they'd ever seen people with boots on. Um, where were our feet? Did we have toes? We had these enormous rucksacks on our backs. Oh. You know, if they had any concept of alien life forms, then we must have fitted the bill. From what I've read, I think that they probably think that white people bring about the end of the world, and that's in their culture, which might go some way to, to explaining what all of the pointing to the sky and holding their heads was all about. I don't think it's the last time it's going to happen. I think there are still people out there who have not been seen. But those people we, we came across, yeah, certainly among the last. Six weeks after setting off, Bruce and Mark were approaching the foothills that led to their ultimate goal, the 15,420-foot mountain Mandala. It is not the highest peak in that part of the world, but it is the most remote. No one had ever attempted to climb its precipitous south face or the punishing approach from the south that Mark and Bruce were taking. The foothills instantly gave us an impression of what was to come. There was no like gradual rolling hills, it was instant terror. All of a sudden, the rivers were just cutting massive deep ravines. It was sharp, it was nasty, it was jagged, and the paths, lots of the times, were just sheer precipices and uh, some really nasty, nasty trekking. Trekking wasn't made any easier by the fact that they still had no porters. The plan was to reach a village six days away to try and hire some more. In the meantime, with the change in terrain, the nights were getting colder. have gone to bed, it seems. Uh, Bruce is about 20 yards back up behind me. Superman's just at the same distance down towards the river. We had to move on to higher ground because the river was rising dramatically. It's been a really tough day today. 
We've been going up and down these impossibly steep slopes with tangled roots and tree bridges, all very, very slippery. And uh, I reckon about one in three footsteps, your foot just, my feet certainly, just went one way and I went the other. Lots of falls and, uh, and as usual, the rucksacks wear an absolute ton. Then again, my feet are wet. Bruce has gone to bed with his, uh, his right foot's playing up again. So uh, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll make our destination, which is a small village, um, which is supposed to be a couple of hours from here. But uh, at the moment we're back down near the river and it's raining again. The next day brought good and bad news. In the village, they succeeded in finding some new porters, but Supratman decided he could go no further. The weeks of hard living had taken their toll, and he was ill with malaria. It was time to say goodbye. Makasi vanya, Superman. And the bike's kali. Makasi vanya. Yeah. To makasi boss. Some vajum palagi, yeah? Salamat. Salamat jalan. Superman had a tear in his eye there, and it was very touching. Despite the extra help, they were very run down. Their infected cuts got worse, and in the humidity, never healed. And they were trying to save their dwindling, dehydrated food for the mountain. In the meantime, the only thing they could do was live off the land, with their new porters providing the menu. As soon as any wild creature would cross their path, they, they'd snap it up and eat it, and nothing is sacred. They eat the lot. And uh, so we partook in some of these little meals that they had, not because for any cultural reason, but because we were starving. Is this a yeah. I think I got more fluff than I did meat. Very rich. I've eaten some really rough things over the years, and uh, that meal, we were eating the intestines, we were eating the genitalia, they were eating the skull and the brains. I mean, there is not a scrap that isn't eaten. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Claws and all, mate. There's nothing that's come off this. <laughs> I'm not sure if I want to, really. <laughs> oh, oh, grim. Oh, I've got a bit of liver, and that's almost certainly a kidney. The liver's very good, actually. Yeah. Well, like duck liver. And the mouth? One big black guy. Shall I go? At least the rivers were easier to cross in the mountains or so it initially seemed. We weighed more than anything that had ever gone across that. And even though we were already getting thin by that stage, um, we still weighed more than most of the locals. And we were carrying you know, huge, great bags as well. Two of them snapped there. As I was going across it, some of these little bamboo ties were snapping. There was not much I could do about it. Yeah, I couldn't stop, or I just had to keep going. And they went with a bit of a twang as well. Even above the rush of the water, you could hear them, even if you couldn't see them. After 50 days of hard expeditioning, it was not surprising that at times their relationship was feeling the strain. There are times, especially when we're walking along and we don't talk to each other, and if it's a pretty tough path, that your mind naturally, as has been written by many other expeditioners in the past, naturally need some sort of energy to feed on so that you can like lose some aggression on the path that you're going on and that the only natural thing quite quite obviously is is your partner and the, just the little things about it and it's only because we're in this situation now that that these things may be raised it's quite important to bruce i think that this expedition is as hardcore as possible and uh, and this comes out in in what we carry which is quite a major factor for me on this expedition because I am undoubtedly less fit than Bruce and probably just less strong uh, than Bruce is, physically strong. Um, so I have been, I've been struggling at times 
Um, I think my rucksack is a, is a ludicrous weight. I've, I sort of mull over the fact to myself as I wrench it over a rock here and over a log there and think, you know, hardcore expedition adventurers like Heinrich Harrow, who came here 50 years ago, he balked at, uh, at carrying half the weight we're carrying. But, uh, but he wants to carry everything. He wants to, uh, it's, it's very important to him that he carries everything that he can and no one else helps him do that. To the trained eye, it, it would be quite obvious who is in the Royal Marines and who is in the uh, cavalry, because uh, Mark's had a, a little bit of bad luck at times on this expedition. It's mainly due to the fact that he probably, in his military training, was used to having a big tank and just having a big bucket where he could throw all his kit into. Whereas I've, of course, always been used to uh, having a rucksack and I'm, I'm quite good at looking after my kit. Considering what we've been through and where we are and what we've got to come, it's just such a minor thing, it's not, it's not important. The next bridge was built over the lip of a waterfall which plunged 120 feet. I heard it snap before it actually went. It was one of those sort of slow motion things. And I just felt my right foot plunging down. So I knew that if I leant any further back, the water was gonna grab the pack and flip me underneath. But my fingers managed to get into, the, uh, into a, a crack in the rock face. And all I was just conscious of one thing, and that was um, the other bit of wood was fine. That wasn't gonna give. I didn't think it was gonna give. But I could feel the water tugging at, the, at my pack. Bruce and Mark were making slow progress, covering an average of only three miles a day. Their next objective was a well-earned break in the village of Tabasic to take advantage of all the facilities for rest and relaxation it could offer. <laughs> Penis gourds are worn throughout the mountainous areas of Irian Jaya. We were always going to be strangers and people from a strange land with odd kit and different, different outlooks on, on everything. That was just one very easy way of losing the mystique of who we were and what we were and where we came from and what our motives were and why were we there. And it could, you know, it could finally open the last barrier between us and them from their point of view. And Bruce is hung like a brontosaurus, so um, they couldn't find one to fit him. So eventually someone dashed off into their hut and came back with this thing, which I think, I mean, it was, it was blackened from smoke. It had been hanging up on the rafters for years, and it was just completely black. And I think it had been used as a, as a tobacco pouch or something in the past. But they drilled the right holes in it, and they put threaded some string through, and that was his, uh, that was his penis cord. <laughs> but we had a bit of a fitting session, and, like, that was the one. <laughs> Remarkably, a lot of them were really quite small the guys up there on that one down. And I'm not saying that Mark isn't, but I just had to fit in a bigger one. There was an element of going up river, going native, but it was all really tied in with just the, the people we were with and, and just that feeling of, of wanting to be a part of everything they did and, and going at it wholeheartedly rather than just being observers. We became much more at one with, with the people that we were with. And also we got to know each other much better and, and some of the problems we had initially were swept away and, and we chatted more and we were much more of a, a good, good couple, so to speak. 70 days after setting off from the coast, Mandala was at last in sight. But the final approach was formidable. 
we stop for a rest and they start spreading. That's not the path, is it? Is it? Is it? Is it? Is it? Is it? Often the paths come across these like sheer rock faces and so the only way that they have of climbing these is actually by making a, a, a tree scaffold which they pin to the rock in some fashion and, and climb them and they're all obviously bound together with rattan and, and the, in places they've been there for years and so they're a bit, a bit uh, rotten in places and often couldn't take our weight. I often wonder what these people think of us, me and Mark, as we're slipping and sliding all over the place. And uh, I, it, they're just so much more agile and so, and, and so much more strong in many ways as well when it comes to these sort of paths. That they must just think we're disabled, really. They insisted on making these like, beautiful little bridges for us to always keep our feet dry. Um, and we were happy with it and they were very proud and, and pleased to do it for us. It was great. It was really good. Besides the physical journey, there is definitely a um, voyage into yourself, into your own psyche. And life becomes very simple in a way. You have a task which you want to achieve, and you have your companions who you also need to achieve that task. And, and you grow very close to those companions, and it's, uh, in many ways it's a very simple life, even though it's, you know, it's, it might be full of hardship or, or challenge or whatever, but the life is simplified. And it gives you a chance to sort of step back and look at, uh, you know, look at everything around you with new eyes. At last, they reached the foot of the mountain. Before it had just been on a map, you couldn't actually see what it was all about. And now we could see this stupendous abyss that had been written about. And it looked awesome. It was one thing to reach the mountain but quite another to climb the 4,500-foot sheer south face. Their porters had serious doubts about them carrying on any further. They looked at us, they could see the state we were in, the great sort of sores all over our legs and feet and hands and arms. We were skin and bones compared to them, with no muscle on us. And they were very concerned, they didn't want us to climb at all. And you could see their point. We didn't look as if we were capable of climbing anything, let alone that mountain. We were both aware that time was running out. We knew you know, we couldn't live for another three weeks and still keep losing weight like this and still have a go at it. We had to do it. We had to do it now or never again. Leaving the porters, they pushed on up the mountain. After two days, they established a camp at 12,000 feet at the base of the unclimbed face proper. But picking a way up the rock face toward the summit was a constant challenge. Every day brought its own new torments in that we didn't know whether the next day we were actually going to be able to make it. There were so many false summits that you'd, you'd go forward a little bit one day, have a look, see if you could climb it, come back, get your kid, and then go and climb that bit, only to think that the next day there might be just one last little, little cliff that we couldn't climb, which would have meant that we'd have to go all the way back and try it from another route. Their ropes were meant for crossing rivers, and were useless for holding a climbing fall. They could only aid descent. Because we couldn't use our ropes for the climb itself, we had to, what they call free climb, which is just like scrambling up it as best you can with absolutely no protection. We knew that not being attached at all to the, to the mountains, that any fall, of course, would be instantly fatal. And then ahead, we could see was the final bridge. And it, it was definite this time that was the final cliff, the last bridge line. And thereafter, if we got to the top of that, we were you know, as near as damn it there. <laughs> Suddenly, the exposure was just like huge. I had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of meters below me. And I remember pulling off a stone and dropping it into the cloud and just watching it bounce once and then disappear into this cloud below, knowing that there was all that beneath me and I wasn't tied on. We didn't get any rain last night, so we just had enough water to cook by last or this morning. But my word, I've got a drop of moisture. 
I think this is the one, mate. Well, I can't see anything higher. Brucey, my boy. Congratulations, Mark. Shake my hand. Good call, mate. Congratulations. Congratulations. <laughs> oh, I must feel like... Uh. That is such good news. I've always wondered what it felt like to get to the top of an in-your-face mountain. Really struggle to get up there, spend ages doing it, and finally reach the top. And now I know. Bollocks! <laughs> When I first saw this little dot on a map many years ago, I knew I would get here, but I didn't think I'd have so much fun. And I didn't think it would be such, a, such an amazing experience, the whole of the expedition just coming to one little place. Yeah. And uh, it's cool. It really is the icing on the cake. Yeah, isn't it? yeah, yeah. The cherry on the icing on the cake, mate, <laughs> is what I was trying to say, but I'm not very good at English. <laughs>